Hello. Well, today I want to talk about the genre that Star Wars um, is in. Now, I'm sure there's some who might be wondering why you would one even think there's a real debate there, or even that would even come into question. You know, it's science fiction. Primarily, it's space opera. George Lucas himself has even said that. Well, there are people who say it's complete fantasy. It's not science fiction at all. The only science fiction is the futuristic setting in the lightsabers and guns, vehicles. That's it. Everything else is complete fantasy. Now, while there are story elements to it, and I think the best example is the original Star Wars, you know, A New Hope, with how the story and the characters align. Luke's farm boy meets 3PO and R2, which sort of kickstarts his adventure into, into meeting Obi-Wan Kenobi, who it appears to be like the wizard of the story. And then he eventually... Uh, goes with Obi-Wan, or Ben, as he is called quite a bit throughout the film, by Luke. Um, he, they go to the Mos Eisley Cantina, meet uh, Chewbacca and Han Solo, and from there they go off into find and rescue Princess Leia from Darth Vader. Um, even though they originally planned to put the, or go to Alderaan and everything, but nope. If you've seen the movie, you know that doesn't turn out very well. Um, and also, Once Upon a Time is quite fairy tale esque right? And in Star Wars we have A Long Time Ago in a Galaxy Far, Far Away. Um... And also the Force. You know, I think the Force, you know, it's sort of like magic. Um, but there is sort of a scientific element to it, which of course the prequels uh, obviously showed um, with the midi chlorines, which I know people aren't really fond of. But George Lucas. Uh, mentioned midi chlorines in an interview as early as 1977. You can look this up if you would like. Um, so that means at some point from between 1973, when he began to really outline <clears throat> the original genesis of the, what would become the Star Wars trilogy with bits and pieces of what the prequels would be, which, you know, as time went on with the prequels, or as the original trilogy went on, he uh, dealt, dabbled in writing a bit more for what the prequels would become. Uh, you know, it, the the basic of at some point in writing Star Wars in this big like 250, 300 page script when it was supposed to be at one point to be a uh, sort of an outline kind of grew uh, bigger than he anticipated and uh, uh, yeah it's somewhere from there until the final draft of the script that would be to film Star Wars for he put in the Chlorians at some point you know with the original film when writing it making it. So I don't believe he really pulled that out of nowhere because the answer he gave and sort of a little explanation seemed to be that he thought about that quite a bit. Um, now, and I have found an article uh, about uh, discussing Star Wars and how it saved space opera. And um, Before we get there, I kind of want to talk a bit about uh, the definition of space opera, which is a novel, movie, or television program set in outer space, typically a simplistic or melodramatic nature. 
or in a simplistic and melodramatic nature. And well, with Star Wars, there is quite a lot of melodrama. You don't really get too much melodrama in fantasy films, not typically. Um, not that it can't happen, but normally you don't see that. You know, Star Wars isn't a straightforward science fiction uh, film. Science fiction typically is about the idea of something. If you're doing space opera, it's about like characters and they drive the plot, not like this idea that, you know, that this film was film or book or show is presenting and then the characters sort of follow through with that. Um, you know, space opera is quite a bit character based. You know a lot about characters uh, in Star Wars. A lot of them are beloved. It's also why people enjoy Star Wars. Um, now with this article, um, uh, yeah, it's it was made this year, April 29th, 2020. It's called How Star Wars Saved Space Opera. Story of how a sci-fi classic turned the most contemptuous subgenre into one riddled with acclaimed masterpieces. Sorry, I just butchered that up, and I'm also it's a bit late, so yeah. but that seems to be typical by this point. But I will. Do what I can to go through this. Um, in 1977, young filmmaker George Lucas re released his space epic about a young boy, Luke, in a galaxy far, far away, who was called upon to fulfill a prophecy by stopping evil and bringing balance to the galaxy. What if I told, were to tell you that this con conception of a sci-fi classic began in 1783? Almost two years, two hundred years of development before the film hit the screen. Uh, you think I'm crazy, but think again. 19, in 1783, not 19, Frederick Schiller began write down the first bits of a play that would be called Don Carlos, based on a historical character of the same name. In 1867, an opera inspired by the play called Don Carlo was first performed in London. In 1977, Star Wars premiered in 32 American theaters but soon broke box office records. Over the course of the couple of centuries between Schiller's Don Carlos and Lucas's Star Wars, the story of destiny, liberation, and forbidden love has been revealed revised and rewritten until finally we found the screens in America. Americans and critics alike were suddenly obsessed with this aging subgenre of science fiction, space opera. But what is space opera? What is its connection to an opera in the 19th century, if any? By looking into the subgenre's origins and conventions, comparing the film Star Wars and the opera Don Carlo, Looking at another example of space opera after Star Wars, I believe it will be clearer to see what makes up a space opera and how Star Wars took this subgenre from critical contempt to worldwide worship. Origins and conventions of space opera. The origin of what will be known as space opera is highly disputed because of the nature of how the subgenre was born, out of critical disdain. What we do know is that the latter part of the 1920s is what we call the magazine era. It became a platform for the release of these special, these popular science fiction stories. Stories of adventure and action and space have been written for years before this, but this period saw the emergence of what would become the classic space opera. <clears throat> this is the period where the subgenre would start to naturally form its conventions and traditions, but before we take a look at the 
genre conventions that make a space opera what it is, let's first delve deeper into what the ter where and when the term space opera arose. This might inform us of what the term meant originally. It wasn't until 1941 that the term space opera was associated with the romantic space adventure stories. Wilson Bob Tucker used the term in the 36th issue of his fan magazine, La Zombie, as a derogatory jab at what he considered uninspired works of science fiction that had started to crop up. In fact, here is what Tucker had to say. In these hectic days of phase coining, we offer one. Westerns are, are called horse operas. The morning housewife tear jerkers are, call, are called spade or soap operas. For the hack, hacky, grinding, striking, outworn, spaceship yarn, or world saving, for that matter, we offer space opera. Apologize for kind of messing up there, but I think this article is very good, and, and really lays out better than I ever could have. <laughs> uh, say, so I'm going to continue here. So space opera doesn't have any connection to the popular 19th century genre of opera at all. <clears throat> you have to keep in mind that in the 1940s, the predominant medium for entertainment was radio. Radio, much like modern television, was the platform for weekly or daily story series. These radio shows were called soap operas, named after the soap companies that sponsored the content, were launched in the 1930s as short daily radio texts that focused on the plights of a family in a drama centered on the ongoing development of an ensemble cast. Usually, these programs were very popular, but disdained by critics for their lack of quality storytelling. Tucker used this disdain to describe science fiction stories that he thought lacked the same quality when he titled them space opera. Tucker wasn't alone either. Most critics at the time, and for a long time after, thought the genre was contempt, or it was met with contempt, or seen with it. Yeah. To these critics, space opera was trashy pulp dramas with no value. <clears throat> but what were the convention conventions of this new subgenre that made editors of magazines and critics so against their presence? Well, editors of the time wanted to wanted their science fiction stories to have at least a small tether of scientific accuracy. Editors like Hugo Garzenbach, editor of the popular science fiction magazine Amazing Stories, actively attacked space operas. This dissidence flowed over to what some of the readers who made the same attacks. What uh, Westerfels tells us that Garzenbach's desire for scientific accuracy and logic had the immediate impact as readers enthusiastically embraced these goals and regularly wrote letters chastising authors who failed to achieve them. The main problem with space operas lies in their typical conventions. Space travel, encounters with alien species, and the themes of war and di diplomacy. Space travel wasn't typically condemned, but the, by the way that space operas portrayed it, resulted in the problem for critics. Space operas often implemented faster than light travel, not only between planets and solar systems, but also galaxies. This intergalactic travel led to other conventions of space opera, presence of alien species and themes of war and diplomacy. It seems obvious that when you have interplanetary and intergalactic travel, there will be both encounters with aliens and conflict resulting from these encounters. All these conventions make the subgenre different from the rest of science fiction and incredibly unscientific. That being said, the conventions of these unscientific stories slowly gain the subgenre some popularity. 
one space opera series that skyrocketed to popular success was the Flash Gordon comics. One of the most famous space operas of all time, Flash Gordon, quickly gained popularity and recognition for the space operas. After the series of comics started in 1934, it quickly adapted. It was quickly adapted by Universal and became one of the highest-grossing films of the year. Flash Gordon started a revolution of space operas on the big on the screen that would continue through the 40s and 50s, but critics still weren't convinced. When the 60s rolled around, a new series took a hold of the public's imagination. Star Trek. And of course, you know, Flash Gordon and also Buck Rogers were uh, did influence uh, George Lucas in various ways. Um, he's said so uh, many times. But let us continue. Star Trek took the genre further than it had gone before. And because of that, the public loved it. Star Trek added elements to the classic space operas that was made previously. As Westfall states, Star Trek did contribute something new to space opera, the subject matter and sensibility of the romance novel. These elements expanded the genre and directed the genre closer to something critics would actually pay attention to, the two-dimensional pulp space exploration stories of the 20s are now three-dimensional stories of complicated alien cre cultures, complex romance, and a thrilling adventure. This edition paved the way for the space opera that would top them all and bring the subgenre the respect it sought for decades. The world was finally ready from Lucas's masterpiece Star Wars. <clears throat> and now they're going to Compare Star Wars and Don Carlo, that story that was then made into an opera. While space opera doesn't uh, really have any connection to opera, the popular stage uh, stage genre of the 19th century, George Lucas made a connection. This connection would completely change the reception of space operas. And there's a link here that is underlined and there's links as we go that you can if you look at it you can see articles and this analysis of opera and its history theodore rabe said that opera was then the 19th century what film is now an essential medium for communicating the principal concerns of the day because of this passing of the baton opera influences film in more ways than you could imagine a clear example of this is when you look at Lucas's Star Wars and Vardy's Don Carlo. When you look at the plots of Don Carlo and Star Wars, many parallels become evident. The first is the meeting of the prince, Luke, an unknown prince, and Carlo's a knowing one, and the war hero turned mentor. This meeting results in the call to action for him a trusted mentor or from a trusted mentor that pulls him away from the simple life and into a political sphere. There he gets involved in a rebellion against his father's evil empire. Because of this he finds himself running away from his father who actively is trying to capture him. During all this frenzy the prince witnesses the sacrifice of his mentor. This sacrifice inspires the rebellion even more, which leads to the most memorable of all the plot points, the destruction of the evil war machine. In Star Wars, this is the classic destruction of the Death Star, the Spanish Armada in Don Carlo. To make it plain to see here, here's a list of 17 plot parallels between the film and, and the opera, formulated by Jeffrey High. <coughs> One, a plea from the oppressed provinces. Two, an ancient religion divided into two sects, light and dark side. One resists the other's rule of terror. Three, distracted prince who lost his mother at childbirth, Luke and Carlos. 
4. The Territorial Governors 5. A war hero mentor who rebels against the Empire Roger Rodriguez and Obi-Wan Probably mispronouncing it, apologize Forbidden love between the prince and a female family member. The actions of a stepmother, sister, or slash sister, as the allegorical embodiment of Republican virtue. The burned skeletons of territorial subjects. <clears throat> a conspiracy of the prince and the queen slash princess against the tyrant. The past friendship between the war hero mentor and the father, Vader and Philip. The exhaustive search for the secret slash stolen war plans. The fourth, fifth acts spent in jail cells and dark passageways teeming with guards. The prince sneaking through the passage, passageways in disguise. A function of two supporting characters, longtime royal court insiders who provide the backstory. The political manifestations of the of a source of uh, all evil behind the father slash tyrant. The self-sacrifice of a war hero mentor that inspires a rebellion. <clears throat> and the defeat of the unseekable fleet slash ultimate weapon, the Spanish Armada and the Death Star. It is important to recognize all these similarities between Lucas's Star Wars Rivardi's Don Carlo, by formulating his story around that of an already respected opera. Lucas not only put actual meaning behind the opera in space opera, but also demanded respect from critics of his work, and it worked. It worked so well, in fact, that Star Wars is number 15 on the very respected American Film Institute's top 100 films, and is the only space opera to even be on the list. To see the effects of this success, it would be prudent to not look at the examples of a respected space opera composed after Star Wars. Hyperon. Hyperon. I, I have never read this book. Hmm. Interesting. It, I mean, I've looked, I've looked at this article, but I've never read this book, and no. Hyperon, yeah, Hyperon, yeah. When we look at an example of space opera produced after Star Wars, we can see how the subgenre developed further because of the advancement made by the famous sci-fi franchise. This example is the 1989 novel by Dan Simmons, Hyperon. Hyperon is a fantastic adventure written in the form of... Uh, Chaucer's Cadbury's Tales that follows a group of pilgrims on their journey of fulfill or to fulfill a traditional pilgrimage to pacify an evil entity called the Shrike. Because of its brilliant style and story, Hyperon went on to win the 1990 Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. What makes this even more incredible is the fact that the Hugo Award was named after Hugo Gerzbach, the famous uh, magazine publisher I mentioned before. The avid opponent of space opera now has his name stamped on one. In fact, the Hugo Award will go on to be stamped on several space operas after the release of Star Wars. Ender's Game, Star Tide Rising, The Uplift War, and many more beat out the traditional science fiction novels of the coveted award. It seems that the critics had finally come around. After Star Wars, the stigma surrounding the subgenre dissipated. The success of novels like Hyperon proves this. In conclusion, I think what really brings what Star Wars really brings back to or brings to science fiction and space opera is a new focus by Harkening the back of the operas of the centuries before, Lucas took the opera, or the space opera, to new heights. While space opera wasn't based on an actual opera, Lucas took inspiration from and molded his film on an actual opera 
giving this space upper legitimacy. Instead of looking at the term with its negative connotation, Lucas took the derogatory term literally and connected his science fiction film with an actual opera. By making the connection that was hiding in plain sight, Lucas garnered the respect for the genre. After release, its release in, <clears throat> of Star Wars in 1977, we saw the critics laid off this subgenre. In fact, from what we saw with both books like Hyperon Critics started to praise the works that fit into space op the space opera genre. The space opera genre. Bleh. We saw that space operas began to receive coveted awards like the Hugo Award for Best Novel, and the effect was not just in the world of literature. After the release of Star Wars, we can see the production of space opera films exploded. Space opera movies like Dune and The, La the Last Starfighter and Alien began to pop up like they never had before. Hollywood even decided to remake Flash Gordon in 1980, the new space opera renaissance that happened after 1977 was a rebirth, uh, the redemption of a genre. Space opera was finally baptized into the world of critical praise by its savior, Star Wars. And, uh, yeah. I know I kind of <laughs> stumbled and uh, oh, <clears throat> had a bit of trouble there at certain points, but... You know, I'm not really used to reading off of articles, but I thought this one was really uh, an article that was really worth looking into. And again, there are links at various points, so if you read it for yourself, you can uh, go to those links and uh, sort of expand, uh, expand on what the article says at various points. Um, yeah, I hope it wasn't too terrible. I hope it wasn't... <clears throat> A horrible experience listening to me read from that uh, article, but I really thought it was a very good article, and it really helped put into perspective of that Star Wars is a space opera, and because of Star Wars, space opera became quite respected. And again, there are fantasy elements to Star Wars. George Lucas has acknowledged that, but he's often emphasized the <clears throat> space opera aspect. And I think with the melodrama part, I think that's quite evident, uh, particularly with some of the dialogue. I mean, George Lucas did write the first six Star Wars films. They don't have the greatest dialogue ever, but for the genre, it, it fits. The melodrama that goes on in the films does make sense. The performances being melodramatic at times makes sense. I know Hayden Christensen has gotten his fair share of detractors and haters, but with the genre uh, that Star Wars is in, and also the dialogue, which again, Lucas himself has acknowledged he's not the best at writing, it does fit, and he did his the best job. Um, the romance scenes, really in particular, I think is what really uh, kind of has people really uh, detach from the performance by Hayden Christensen. But, you know, the fact that he, he has never really uh, really loved anybody outside of his mother, <clears throat> because as to, to be a Jedi, you can't have feelings. Well, you know... Yeah, uh, falls in love with Padme, it, sort of all at once. He doesn't really know how to articulate his feelings very well. Um, so, from that regard, you know that's it's not that terrible. Some people complain about Mark Hamill's performance in Star Wars being whiny, but when you live on a, a sand planet like he does. You're a moisture farmer, and uh, you want to go off and do something exciting, do something meaningful, but then uncle who you live with him is constantly pulling you back, and you can't go out there and do this. You can't do that. You know, blah, blah, blah. 
basically trying to make him just be a farmer. Uh, he's going to be a bit whiny, and also the little banter in Star Wars they get with Owen and Luke. Uh, I get the feeling every time I watch it, there's a lot more to uh, those two of that dynamic that we don't see, we don't really hear about. And, um, yeah. That's, uh, really it. Um, this is quite long, or lengthy. Apologize for the length. Um, but, uh, yeah. There are obviously fantasy elements put into Star Wars, but it is primarily space opera. Um, if you look at the definition alone, look at Star Wars, the connection is very apparent. Um, but yeah, uh, let me know what you think if you want in the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, I will uh, see you all uh, next time. Hope you all have a great day, a great week, a weekend and a great week. See you next time. Bye.